Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Want an extraordinary life? Just master your code, says our guest, Darren Gold. Darren, thanks for being with us. Oh, Bill, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Darren, uh, you know I told you before the show I love your book, Master Your Code, but I'd like you to start off by telling us a little bit about your personal story and what your uh, life was like uh, going back, uh, let's say, childhood to the present. Yeah, it's it's a story that uh, I'm only sort of recently, maybe the last 10 years, have been really comfortable sharing, and I'd be happy to do that. Um, you know, I, I start usually with my father because he was such an instrumental figure in my life. And uh, I grew up with him, really, single father raising me in a one-bedroom apartment um, in a pretty tough area uh, in Southern California. I had moved from London, England, where I was born. Uh, my father, um, at a very early age, turned to a life of crime. And so I was born into that setting. Uh, uh, I was also born into a setting where I had a father that really loved me, which was the silver lining. But surrounding me was uh, a lot of crime and violence, um, drug addiction, alcohol abuse. Both my mother and father spent sort of intermittent uh, periods of time in, in jail. Um, and so in many ways, it was pretty chaotic and in retrospect, I could say unsafe. But as I said before, the um, the silver lining was a father that was really uh, dedicated uh, to me uh, and loved me unconditionally. Uh, but it was really out of that experience that I made a very early declaration, which was um, that I would lead a very different life, and it's really shaped who I've become. And if I remember, and I'm going to take you fast forward, uh, into your 30s, you were serving on boards, you were in a great position, and then something else happened, am I correct? Yeah, it, you know, I had a very sort of meteoric um, professional uh, career, uh, and I attribute a lot of that to this sort of almost blind uh, focus on getting ahead and uh, getting the sort of life and financial security that I hadn't had when I was a child. And in many ways, it produced some pretty um, pretty outstanding results. So we'll get to where it limited me a lot. Uh, I found myself um, really at what I considered at the time the pinnacle of my career, uh, working as a partner in a private investment firm, managing hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, sitting on boards of companies. And um, uh, one day I walked into the head of my firm's office and I was summarily fired. And it was the first time really in my personal and professional life that I had suffered what I considered then to be a real failure. And it really shook me to my core. Uh, it was, you know, Warren Bennis, the you know, leadership expert once said, these are the sort of crucible events that happen in many people's lives. And this was really that kind of crucible event for me. And it forced me to take a hard look at myself and my life and um, really began uh, this journey of self-mastery that I've been on now for, for some time. And I love that you start off uh, early in your book and you say, I am the author of my own life. And do most mm. people realize this or does that almost come as a shock to them? I, it came as a shock to me, okay. <laughs> and I think it does come to a shock to, as a shock to most people. I think it's a matter of timing if you ever really discover it. I was fortunate in this sort of catalytic event to uh, begin to begin to see for the first time that while I thought I was the author of my life, that I was really shaping my life, I was being driven by a uh, subconscious program, a set of rules, values, and beliefs that in some ways were really serving me and in many ways were limiting me. I say in the book, you know, I was, I, you know, I realized almost 40 years old that I had been run by this program that was written by a seven-year-old boy. And um, this notion of, um, that very notion and the awareness of it um, is, was such a fundamental game changer for me because it, bega it gave me uh, some insight into, you know, why I was behaving the way I was behaving. And then most importantly, um, the big aha was that I had choice. And I had choice to sort of, you know, invent the life that I wanted for myself. Um, and that, that's really sort of at the essence um, of the book that I've written. Now, I read there that everyone is, and you just mentioned it, is run by a subconscious program. 
of their yeah. own making. Can you explain for that in kind of layman's terms what you mean and how we would see that in our daily life? Yeah, I mean, from the earliest uh, moment, you, you know, from the very moment you're born, you begin to construct, and I use that word really intentionally because we don't think we make these things up. And you know, in some ways they're given to us, right, by our family of origin, by our culture, but we are making up and constructing beliefs and rules about who we are, who other people are, how the world works. And so I call these beliefs, values, and rules the kind of lines in a program um, that you begin to aggregate over time. And by the time you're in your adolescence and certainly into adulthood, you have thousands of these subconscious constructed rules, values, and beliefs. Together they form what I call a program, I use the computer program as a metaphor, that are really dictating how you make sense of the world. And in that making sense of the world, how you act and the results that you get in your life. And it sort of goes back to this massive realization that I had with this sort of kind of crucible event that, wow, much if not all of my life had been sort of run by this subconscious set of values and rules. Wouldn't it be interesting to take a look at where those rules came from, what they are, and have some choice over them? When you say we should master our code, what is the code? Is that the rules you're talking about? Well, I draw this distinction between program and code, and it's sort of my distinction, but for the purposes of the book and the way I talk about this, the program is this subconscious set of rules, values, and beliefs. It's what most of us, until we have an event or some unearthing of it, some awareness of it, um, are run by, and it can serve us perfectly fine. And I draw the distinction with a co between a program and a code. A code for me uh, is a intentionally constructed set of values, beliefs, and rules that is purposefully designed to achieve extraordinary results. And so I say that I'm, the big shift you can make is being run from uh, and run by a program to intentionally crafting and constructing a code that really serves you. And I like and that the way you, book. Uh, it, I'm yeah. sorry. You said intentionally constructed for extraordinary results. I think that's what we all want. Yeah. So uh, now you've got us all listening closely. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the big question, right? I, in, in the work that I do, which is with very senior leaders, everybody is looking to lead an extraordinary life. Now, people can define that in very different ways. Um, and there's lots of room for different interpretations and definitions for what constitutes an extraordinary life. But whatever it is that that constitutes an extraordinary life for you. That's what we're really searching for. And the big question that I seek to address and answer and give guidance on is what's getting in the way of you leading an extraordinary life? And I take a stand that everybody has the potential to lead one. Um, and the premise of the book is it's this underlying program that what, while it has served you in many ways, is really getting in the way of the results that you're really looking for in life. In Darren, any dimension of your life. Darren, at this point in the show, I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Darren Gold, G-O-L-D, and his book is Master Your Code. Darren, can you tell us where can we get this book, and is there a website where we can learn more? Yeah, it's available on Amazon, uh, all forms, hardcover, paperback, um, Kindle, and I also narrate the audio book. If you uh, like the sound of my voice, I would uh, recommend that as well. And then I have an author website, which is Darren J. Gold, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-G-O-L-D. And my firm where I do my professional work is Trium Group, T-R-I-U-M-G-R-O-U-P.com. You can learn more about the book and me and the work that I do on, on those two websites. And I'm glad you mentioned that you have an audio book. If someone says, well, I'm not really a reader or I don't like to read mm -hmm. or I fall asleep. First of all, I think it's a great book. I call it a dirty book because my book is all underlined, my copy of your book, <laughs> and I put notes. And, and that to me is a special uh, A-plus book when, when I do that. But if someone else doesn't like to read, that's fine. Get the audio book. If you can change your life for whatever that may time may be involved, go to the library, go to the bookstore, what a difference. And if a few new ideas come in, wouldn't it be great to enjoy your life for that many more years, pass it on to family members, etc.? So we'll be telling you more, but we want to find out for more from Darren as, as we go through the show. Now, Darren, you mentioned that there's three essential things we must know about this program. What should we know? What are those three essential things? Yeah, and I've be begun to refer to them. But the first thing is that every single part of your program, every belief you hold, 
is made up, was subconsciously constructed, largely in response to your environment. And that's a big aha for most people. I mean, what do you mean they're made up? Right? And I think if you start from that premise that every belief, and if you test it, you'll see it to be true. So that's number one. Number two is that almost all of your program was designed to keep you safe, um, not necessarily for you to thrive. And it's sort of how the human species survived. And number three is since your program, your beliefs, your values or rules were made up, they can be reconstructed. And this is really the human superpower. It's the ability to choose the beliefs, the values, the rules, the way we make meaning of any situation or circumstances. And that's, that's sort of the three things that I uh, address up front and really want to make the reader aware of. And I just want to emphasize that you tell us that mastering your code is the most fundamental choice a person can make in their life. So if we can do this, and I think you've spelled it out for us, and it certainly makes sense. Everybody can hear what you're saying. Um, a lot of those big changes that we're looking for, whether it's finding just happiness in the world, the right companion, the right puppy, uh, job, or maybe even changing careers or uh, vocations, etc. I-, I think the secret is in this book, and we call our show The Secrets of Success, but it's our authors who provide those secrets, and definitely I think uh, if someone is out there looking, they should take a look at mastering I'm sorry, master your code. Um, Darren, why is awareness of beliefs so important? Why do you emphasize that? Well, I say in the book, you can't change what you can't see, right? And oftentimes we go through life completely unaware that we are being run by a set of beliefs. We don't even see them as beliefs themselves. They're just the way I am or the way the world works. And I you know, tell the, the story of the two fish who uh, you know are swimming and an older fish swims by and the older fish says, hey boys, how's the water? And the two younger fish, smaller fish say, what the hell is water? And we're like that. That's sort of a metaphor for our lives is we're swimming metaphorically through the waters of our beliefs and values and rules and every single part of who we are, how we behave, the decisions we make and ultimately the results we get are a function of those beliefs, values and rules and we're not aware of them. So the most fundamental thing, and it's the first chapter, it's foundational, is that we need to understand that and begin to see what was previously unseen. And once you've got that, and that for me in my own experience in my own life was a a huge game changer because I began to see access to choice um, and uh, and doing things differently when, when it served me. Darren, you mentioned that uh, today your life is aligned with your purpose. Can you tell us how that is and use your own life as an example for our audience? Yeah, I mean, this is the work that I do. I do it in the context of of business, and I work with very senior executives. Um, uh, So I have this really incredible privilege to be um, working with uh, very influential and leaders who have the ability to impact others. Um, but also, um, to do that work really well, I have to you know, really be devoted to and committed to uh, working on myself. And those things line up uh, perfectly for me, which, uh, if you know, as I think about my own career, I was always searching for, you know, what is it that I can do vocationally? In the last chapter, I talk about the Japanese concept of ikigai, which is what I'm good at, what the world needs, um, what, I can, um, what I can get paid for, and what the world values. And um, those sort of things have really lined up for me in the last decade of my life in particular. So I, I feel very blessed. Darren, we want to find out more about Master Your Code, but at this point in the show, we want to remind our listeners that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. We'll be right back after the break. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. 
Uh, I'm coming back. I ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. Brought to you by the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to You're Listening to The Secrets of Success on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan, and our guest today is Darren Gold, author of Master Your Code. And Darren, before we go further, I'd like our audience to know that if you're enjoying the show or you'd like to listen to some of the points again, you can go to nccradio.org. That's nccradio.org and listen to a podcast of the show anytime. So if there's some points you missed or you want to recommend it to a parent, friend, or uh, son or daughter, easy to do. Listen to the podcast, enjoy it, and then go out and get a hold of a copy of Master Your Code. Now, you mentioned in your book there are 10 declarations to Master Your Code. Hmm. Can you give us some idea what those are? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talked about the first one, uh, which is I am the author of my life. Uh, the second is I act, I don't react. Uh, the third is I play to win. The fourth is I am 100% responsible for my life. The fifth is I forgive unconditionally. Six is I seek to understand. Seven is I own my identity. Uh, the eighth one is I never stop learning and growing. And the ninth is I am my word. And finally, uh, I live on purpose. Those are the essential kind of lines of code, so to speak, for leading an extraordinary life. Wow. <laughs> that, that's something I think our audience wants to go through because I'm looking at them. And of course, I had a chance before the show and preparing the show. And I'm looking at them and say, boy, if I did those things, I, it's almost a must. It's like uh, making a cake better or a good steak. It, life is going to be a lot better and a lot easier. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to get closer to my goals. Uh, you mm. also mentioned that um, when you choose a new belief, options expand. Can you tell us how yeah. that happens? Yeah. Let me give you a concrete example so that we move from kind of the abstract to the real here. Um, when I moved uh, from London, England, where I was born to Southern California, I was uh, eight years old uh, and I had, a, of course, an English accent. Now, you know, if you're 18, that's kind of cool. If you're eight, not very much so. Um, and I was teased, you know, mercilessly. Um, so in that moment... In response to my environment, you know, being teased, I developed a belief, and I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't really realize it until much later in life, that I had to be liked. So here we are, right? A, a line of my program is being formed, and it was so essential to me feeling safe and loved and worthy and included that it just became the way I was, and I got really good at being likable. Um, I was good at school. I was included. I had good friend groups. I had professional success early on, the difficult clients, I would be the one that uh, they'd send to. Um, uh, but it really started to limit my effectiveness, particularly as I got more, a little bit more senior uh, in my career. I was so committed to being liked that I had trouble giving people honest, direct feedback. I robbed them of growth. And in some ironic way, I was so likable that people had trouble giving me the kind of feedback that I needed to hear. So I robbed myself of my growth. So when I talk about examining your beliefs and then expanding them. When I woke up to the fact that I was being run by this seven, eight-year-old belief, and I said, wait a second, I don't have to be liked. Now, it's good to be liked, but I don't have to be driven by it. I can expand that to say, you know, it's okay if I'm just seen as neutral. Uh, or maybe there are situations where it's okay to not be liked. Um, now, my range of options, right, is massively expanded. I can have a conversation with you that's mature and honest, um, very constructive. I can also do it in a way that makes me likable, but I don't have to. And so my ability as a leader in particular um, to have more difficult, challenging conversations, you know, greatly expanded because I took a hard look at that belief and was willing to e examine it and expand it. And that would be one of many uh, beliefs that I've confronted in my life uh, and, and challenged and took on. Now, one of the, uh, I think it was uh, declaration number two, you say, I act, I don't react. And I think of all yeah. of us, don't we hit the horn when that driver gets in front of us <laughs> or uh, yeah. get angry because someone uh, may be taking three seconds longer on the line at McDonald's? Yeah, don't we all and don't I. <laughs> uh, and, and yet the, the myth that I confront and really want to take on in the book and do take on is this myth that we're emotionally hardwired, that we're animals. And of course, that's the way we're going to act, right? Somebody honks a horn at me. 
and I'm going to get mad. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get frustrated, um, and I'm going to react automatically. And the reason why that myth has such staying power is because it seems like it's the case, and it lets us off the hook for being responsible for our actions. And there's a whole host of research more recently that says, hey, wait a second, even our emotions, much like beliefs, are actually constructed. That we construct the emotional connection between somebody honking their horn and being angry very, very early on in childhood. And it's a part of our culture. So we don't see it as something that's constructed. And I assert, backed by a lot of research that I cite in the book, that wait a second, no, even your emotions, the things that seem so automatic are actually constructed. And the big revelation in that is, okay, well, if that's the case, then I have the opportunity, and I say dare, I say responsibility, um, to, to even be cho- choiceful about our emotions. Now, that comes with a lot of responsibility, and it's, a, it's, a, it's hard, but it can be done. That doesn't mean I do it all the time, and I don't find myself being reactive at times, but the difference between where I am now versus where I was 10, 15, 20 years ago is night and day. Uh, Darren, uh, when you mention that, that you say we construct the environment that we live in, is this a tough concept when you're talking to groups for them to understand, or is this something that they automatically get and go home and change three things that first day? Oh, very hard. It may be the hardest thing, right? Because there's a seductive temptation to want to be able to blame our circumstances. We get to be off the hook and not responsible. So when you tell somebody, wait a second, you're the architect of your experience, right? Um, You control your circumstances. You shape the world, not the other way around. That can be hard for people to hear at first. So there's a very, you know, you have to be very nuanced in how you present that. Um, And the first thing I always say is, well, how do I make other people, you know, how do I get other people to get that? I say, you got to get it yourself. And um, so there is a way to get into that conversation, which can um, offer it up as a very appealing place to be, which is not that it's necessarily true because things happen to us and sometimes and many times we don't control them. But what if I were to take a stand in life that I'm 100% responsible, that I construct and shape my environment? Wouldn't that be a powerful place to be? And uh, it takes some time to really get the nuance of that. It doesn't mean that I blame myself. It just means I live from a a different sense of possibility and responsibility. But you're right. it's It's a hard notion for most people, myself included, uh, at first to really get to get and want to get. Darren, I find this fascinating. But before we go further, I'd like to remind our audience that if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm Bill Horan, but the important person today is our guest, Darren Gold. He is the author of Master Your Code. Darren, can you tell us, is there a website where we can find out more information? Yeah, my uh, website is Darren J. Gold, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-G-O-L-D. Dot com, and my firm, the Trium Group, is Trium Group, T R I U M G R O U P dot com, and they're both great sources of information. Now, something I read in your book is that our current program, I guess our lifestyle, the way we're living, does not want change. We want safety. Mm. How do you apply yes. that to this situation? How does that does it help or hurt us? Well, it it does both. Right. So because most of our program, much of our program is safety based, there's a lot of benefit to that. Right. And it's primarily psychological safety we're talking about here, not physical safety. Used to be physical safety. So I'm included. um, I'm liked. Right. Uh, I get to be in control. I get to be right. All of those things. There's something to be said for many and much of that. Um, But it's parsing out what's really serving me in my program and what because it's so safety-based, is holding me back, holding me back from growing, taking risk, um, and living the life that I really want. And so it's not about getting rid of the old beliefs. It's just, it's about seeing what part of them serve me and what part doesn't. And then taking a look at the part that doesn't and finding something else that you can put in its place. Now, Darren, you mentioned uh, in your book there are four steps to mastering our emotions. And as you said, I think that's maybe the tough one because sometimes we want to get angry when someone cuts us off. Uh, they're taking too long ahead of us or uh, they get to the counter and they now they're deciding which hamburger they want, the deluxe, the special, the Baconator, etc. cetera. Um, can you tell us those four steps? Yeah. So, and it's whether it's mastering your emotions or really any belief, any part of your program. Um, the, fir- the first step we've talked a lot about, and that's awareness. 
and if you're listening to this program, which you are, um, you've gotten that. And uh, I would obviously, you know, encourage you to reinforce this notion of like, wow, I have a program. So that's the first step. And it's a big one. Uh, most people don't get there. Um, the second is you've got to name this belief or emotion or whatever it is, this rule. It might be like something, you know, the honk, the, the driver that uh, honks at you. Look, anybody that honks at me for over two seconds is rude. Believe me, that's a part of your program. It's not just happening automatically. Um, so it's to name it. The third step is to really examine it and to sort of say, okay, wait a second. Is that true? Um, and, you know, what happens when I believe that thought? Uh, you know, I, I start going crazy, right? Um, and then the fourth step, which is really the, where all the juice is, is to really begin to question it and to see where the opposite is true. So I often say, like, with business leaders, my team um, isn't focused uh, or isn't being strategic enough. Well, where is the opposite true? Where is it that they are being strategic enough? And where is it that I'm not being strategic enough? And once you start to do that, really question the belief, what you start to do is you begin to loosen your attachment to it. And it's by loosening the attachment where you expand your range of options. Again, it's not like you may not believe there are elements of truth to the belief. It's that you're, just, you're less attached to it, and that's where all the power comes from. Now, you mentioned a few breaths can change this state. When we get excited, should we just, and when I say excited, I mean that the car cut us off, to use the typical yeah. example. Should we just take a few deep breaths? Well, is that all it's going to take, or is there a magic mantra that we say, or what happens? Well, I think what, what I'm referring to in the book is much of our conversation to, up until this point has all been a cognitive. Right? It's all been up in the mind. And there's this, this big thing called physiology, our bodies. And our bodies have an, a massive influence on how we behave, how we act, and the results we get in life. So I talk about three things in the book. I talk about your posture, your facial expressions, particularly smiling, and your breath. When you use those three things intentionally, um, you can influence the signal that your body is sending to your brain. And that's really important. Your body at all times is sending one of two unmistakable signals to your brain. Either I'm safe or I'm in danger. And you're at your best when your brain is receiving the I'm safe signal from your body. And how you're breathing, if you're breathing in a grounded, centered, conscious way, how you hold your body, your posture, if it's open, not closed, and how you're using your face, if you're smiling, not frowning, just to be really simplistic, really massively influences um, the part of your brain that's online. And you're much more able from that place to be choiceful about how you act instead Darren, of just reacting instinctively. Darren, I want to thank you. The time goes much too quickly when we have a guest like yourself. But I want to make oh, sure our you. audience gets it down that the book is Master Your Code. Very simple title to remember. Our guest has a nice, easy name, Darren J. Gold, G-O-L-D. Uh, give us the website real quick again. Darren J. Gold, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-G-O-L-D dot com. Easy enough to remember. Thanks so much. We could spend more hours on this, but for right now, it's just a teaser, so our audience will go out and get the audio book or perhaps read the book. Thanks for being with us today, Darren. We'd like Thank to you. We'd like to let our audience know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.